my grandfather, W.E. Mallory, came to St. Anderson, September 1876, uh, from Jacksontown, New Brunswick, raised on a farm there. And the reason he came down here was he had had a couple serious bouts of pneumonia. And the doctor ordered him to go to the seacoast. So he came to St. Andrews, but in order to uh, have a means of livelihood, he obtained a mail contract to take the mails from St. Andrews to St. Stephen on one day, and St. Andrews to St. George on the following day. And so he had a, a means of livelihood. So he arrived in St. Andrews and stayed at the Kennedy's Hotel, which was in the lower end of town. And he rented a barn at the rear of the hotel for his horses and carriages. And along with the mail deliveries, he started a delivery stable. And that was in September 1876. And he carried on there. But after arriving, he met a St. Andrews girl, Catherine Maloney, who became my grandmother. And in September 1977, they were married. And he continued his mail services plus livery stable work from the Kennedy barn. But in 1879, he purchased this property in the corner of Water Street and Princess Royal and moved his livery stable operation here and lived in the house on the corner. And uh, I have a photograph here of the property as it existed in the summer of 1879. And he carried on here uh, by 17. 84. By that time, he had three sons. But he also had a desire to go back to Woodstock, be near his father and mother, his two brothers and his two sisters. His sister, one sister. And he went back. And he closed his operation. But uh, uh, I think it was due to my grandmother's influence. He only stayed a few months and came back to St. Andrews and reopened the business again. I found an old ad in a paper at the archives indicating the date of the reopening. And he continued, because at that time St. Andrews was beginning to become a summer resort. And in 1880, he had lost the mail contract but he was able to carry on with the livery stable business. In fact, with the Argyle Hotel, and Kennedy's Hotel burned in 1880, and the new one was built in 1881, uh, livery stable business began to pick up because of the summer resort development. And by 1889, 1888-89, he built this building because the old barn wasn't big enough to carry on the operation. So this stable was erected in 1889, opened for business on July the 1st, 1889, which is the same day as the Algonquin opened for business. And he had obtained some kind of an understanding or agreement with the owners of the Algonquin that he would look after all the transportation needs of the hotel. And so he carried on that business until his death in 1921, which was a matter of 32, 32 years, if my arithmetic is correct.
but by 1915, uh, the motor cars were coming in, and the livery stable business was declining and turning into a taxi business. You know, less horses, fewer horses, and taxis. So he bought the first taxi in 1915. And uh, he increased the taxi fleet up until the time of his death. By that time, he had uh, one motorized glassed-in bus, one truck, and I think there were four or five taxis. Uh, but in, 19, in September 1921, he died. But all the years, uh, my father worked with him and looked after him. In, his, in my grandfather's declining years, my father pretty well ran the business. But like my grandfather, my father was not a, he was a horseman. He wasn't a mechanically minded man. In fact, he disliked driving a car. So in 1922, he just closed the door, notified the CPR that operations were ceasing. And, and to, to indicate uh, my father's feeling about driving a car, he, he closed the business in 1922. Uh, he died in 1946, and during that period of time, he never owned a car. He always depended on a taxi or somebody else to drive him. So that is a brief story of the Leary Stable business. My father worked closely with my grandfather, and uh, when he got married, he brought his bride home to live with his father and mother. And uh, when I was born, and my father, my mother died. One of those things that sometimes happened in those earlier days. And uh, my father had no sisters. Uh, my grandparents never had a daughter. And during the time that uh, my father and his bride lived with my grandparents. They became very attached to her, and they promised her that they would always look after me. And consequently, my grandparents brought me up, and I always lived in the home. So uh, the barn was the place to play, and I was around in this barn from the time I could walk. And uh, I recall the uh, the horses and the hired men and the carriages coming in and going out and the buses and the so on. So it was just part of my early life from the time I was born until it was closed in 1922. Uh, I, I have vivid recollections of my grandfather taking me out uh, with him when he would go to exercise the horses, particularly in the wintertime for sleigh rides, and uh, uh, many a ride I had to the school in the coach on a cold or rainy day, and uh, because my grandfather was very overprotective, <laughs> as grandfa grandparents can be. And so uh, I learned to drive a horse when I was about nine or ten years old, but I've never driven a horse since the stable closed, which is a long time ago. I well remember our first taxi, Brass Front Ford, license plates on the wall there. <laughs> and uh, I guess that pretty well sums it up that uh, as a a little boy, and as a growing boy, I was in this barn uh, 
great deal of the time. And now as an older kid, I spend a lot of time here. And I have very, as I say, uh, I have very wonderful uh, memories of my grandparents. As I say, my grandfather died when I was approaching 11. And uh, I lived on in the home there with my grandmother, even though this, the stable was closed in 1922. And, uh, she died in 1927, a sudden seizure, just 10 days before I was to go away to college. And it seems that her mission had been accomplished, that she said she'd always look after me. And uh, the house was rented for a year, or uh, vacant for a year, and then it was rented until I came back here to live in it in 1948. Uh, when I commuted back and forth to St. Stephen, and then later when I lived in St. Stephen, we always kept it to come to in the summertime. Uh, the same as when we lived in Moncton. So this was my home, and uh, I guess that's why my attachment and my uh, appreciation and respect for my grandfather uh, probably drove me to uh, restore the barn a few years ago. As I mentioned, uh, the, the, the operations of the livery stable and taxi service stopped in September 1922. And so the, the barn, they disposed of the wagons and the cars and it just remained vacant uh, for that period of time until Mr. Doon purchased it oh, around 1930, I think it was a 31, just the barn, uh, as an addition to his fish plant, which was at the end of Douglas Street down here. And I think he intended to uh, and my understanding was to turn it into what they call a dry shed for drying and curing fish for the West Indies. The space in the loft would uh, be tremendous for drying the fish. And I think that's one reason why perhaps he took the cupola off, because of the sun on the roof, the terrific heat up there to dry fish, and in, even in the wintertime they could uh, by furnace heat. Uh, but uh, the Depression came along in 1932 and 33, and so the fish business went into a decline, and then Mr. Doon suffered ill health. So the plant, fish plant closed, and his son George used it for a garage and a bicycle shop. Uh, so for those those intervening years, George used it for repairing bicycles mostly. And then uh, when George died in 1983, uh, I happened to be in the hospital with an eye operation at that particular time. And my son came to go to the funeral with my wife. And after the funeral, uh, Bill said to Mrs. Doon, uh, if and when you decide to sell the barn or dispose of the barn, we want the first option. So in, 18, in 1989, she decided to sell. So I got it. And uh, in the fall of 18, uh, 1989, I got Prescott Smith and his sons, two sons, Kim and Vance, to look at it, to restore it, because it uh, needed repairs. So they worked for 
I guess it was three months in the fall, and then back two months in the spring, and they completely restored the building, straightened it up, uh, put new cellar walls where it required, new sills, new boards, uh, renailed all the old boards, a new siding all around, and new windows in many places, and they straightened it up. And uh, at that time, we located some of the embellishments which had been removed from the roof some 50-some years previously. And the Smith brothers restored them and restored the cupola just within the last month. So as you see it today, it looks practically the same as it did in the early days of the stable, except that the, it hasn't got the chimney in it, and it hasn't got the windmill on the roof. Uh, in the early days, uh, I'd get sufficient water to s supply the horses, drinking water, and water to wash them, clean them and to wash the vehicles. They had a pipe line down from uh, the well in, I guess it's Jeannie Simpson's yard now. Then later they had a well dug in the yard with a windmill. But the last few years it was in operation, they had a gasoline engine which would pump the water. But there was a large round tank in the upper part of the, just under the roof to supply the water needs and so the windmill was taken down. But apart from that, the exterior looks just about the same as when it was finished in 1889. And that completed the restoration of it. I felt very strongly about it. I didn't want it to deteriorate anymore. And uh, I guess I'm a bit of a traditionalist. I just wanted it to look like it did when I was a boy. And uh, in fact, I had the sign painter put my grandfather's name over the door. And he was able to do that by counting the clapboards and on a photograph that I supplied him with to duplicate it exactly as it was when it was originally put there. My grandfather's pride and joy was the barn and the vehicles, and in particular the horses. He was a great lover of horses. He knew horses, he understood them, and uh, he could handle horses. And uh, I think that's maybe one of the reasons that he was able to operate a successful livery stable over so many years. Uh, he was very particular about the hired help who handled the horses, that the horses were properly cared for and not abused. He also was a pretty sharp businessman because uh, he outlived uh, three rivals. I think his first rival was a Whitlock stage livery stable at the end of town. And the second one was the Burton Murphy stable, which uh, was at the head of the market war. In fact, uh, Mr. Burton died in the early 1900s and his partner, Murphy, moved to the States. And it was later used as a warehouse and then it was torn down to make way for the present post office. And the last rival was the Denley Station, a Denley livery stable, uh, part of which is still standing in the property across from the Seaside Inn. And uh, Mr. Denley, I think because of his age, and he could see the taxi business coming, he disposed of his he had closed it down in, uh, I don't know, 1919 or 20, somewhere around there.
He looked after the transportation needs of the Kennedy Hotel. And I remember he had just one taxi before he closed it down. Because sometimes the old, the old livery stable people who are horsemen found it difficult to adjust to the motorized vehicle. And uh, so Mr. Denley got out. Uh, I am sure my, this one would have continued longer had my grandfather lived. Uh, he, uh, as I say, he had uh, six or seven vehicles at the time of his death, but uh, down just two or three horses, whereas at one time he had as many as 15. Uh, the, uh, his care and love of horses and a smart businessman, of course I guess I'm a little prejudiced, he, uh, he was the perfect, uh, perfect in my eyes as a boy, and I guess I haven't changed. I think that contributed to his success over all the years. What contract he had or what understanding, if any, of a written contract, I, I have no knowledge. But he did that for the Algonquin Hotel from the 1889 right through until they, when they closed it in 22. In the run of a day, in, particularly in the, when the hotel was open in the summertime, the day started early because uh, in most, uh, most hotel, livery stables in the old days were at the rear of a hotel. But this one was such a long distance from the Algonquin. The day started very early uh, that the trains had to be met uh, and the boats had to be met because practically all, all the passengers, the guests that came to the hotel and the cottages either came in here by train or they came by boat. And I, I can recall uh, in the summertime when I was a young boy that we would have uh, three passenger trains in here in a day in the summertime. In the, in the wintertime, it would be one a day. And uh, in the summertime, there'd be a passenger train in here with the sleeping cars on it from Montreal, another one at noontime, and then an evening train. And then two trains going out. One would go between 7 and 8 in the morning, and another one around 5 o'clock in the afternoon. So the passengers coming and going had to be looked after, and their luggage and baggage. Uh, and as I said, uh, many came by boat. And that, I'm thinking particularly of the Americans, because there used to be a boat service between Boston and St. John. And that boat would land in Eastport, and passengers for St. Andrews could get off at Eastport, and the river boats ran between the islands Eastport and Callis and St. Stephen came in here. So the boats had to be met too. So it was a case of having buses and wagons to look after the needs of passengers arriving by boat and by train. But then there was also the case of taking uh, passengers uh, from the hotel out to the golf. The original golf house was way out by the fifth tee. And then the second one was at the corner, uh, I don't know, Cedar Lane, I guess you call it. And uh, well, it's there by the corner of where the third T is, if you know where that is. We used to call it out by Bowser's. Uh, and so many of the golfers would be transported out there and back. And then he advertised um, trips, sightseeing trips, which were mostly by a single or double carriage, because he had uh, single carriages both open and with the top covered, and double carriages open and covered. And then you've heard of the Surrey with the fringe on top. There were two or three of those. And uh, some people would 
go and drive themselves and their party. Others would require a, a driver. And so he used to have the, a few extras to come in to drive, providing they qualified to suit his needs of looking after a horse and driving properly, and also safeguarding the safety of the passengers. They advertised drives to Shamcook Lake and to Bar Road and the island and round the Glebe Road and uh, out to Joe's Point and so on. So uh, in the run of a day, there would be a number of, of uh, rigs out on a trip such as that. And then, of course, uh, as a livery stable, no, uh, uh, the local transient people arriving with their own horse or would want to bed their horse down and put it, so we had certain stalls for horses to board. <laughs> and so you see, the it, it was a busy spot, particularly in the summertime. But after, of course, after the hotel closed, things quieted down, and uh, he would depend on the local traffic. But then again, uh, he would probably cut down on the number of horses that he kept. He usually added a few in the spring and then he could sell them around to the farmers or anyone who wanted to buy, get a good buying a horse in the fall. So he didn't have to carry them all through the winter when the uh, business dropped off. But uh, like a summer resort today, you, you uh, capitalized during the summer season. You advertise, and uh, in the early stages, when he, uh, along with the uh, uh, carrying the mails, he he, was, he did a stagecoach business too, that he would transport passengers, and also he had a parcel service. I learned that from, of course, that's before my time, but I can remember. I got some old clippings from uh, a newspaper, the old newspapers that I located from the archives, that he had a parcel service, that he would pick up and deliver parcels. You see, anything to make a few bucks in addition to what he got on uh, the regular run. So uh, he would have uh, extra help who worked perhaps the year round to look after the horses or help and to drive. And then he would have uh, a lot of young fellows provide they qualified to drive a horse who could come in, or some older people who drive a horse for an afternoon. And uh, uh, in, in that sense, uh, I often wonder, you know, sometimes they depict a livery stable as not a, a very wholesome environment. Maybe that has something to do with the Hollywood, I don't know. But uh, I remember reading an, uh, an editorial in a magazine about uh, uh, the early days that uh, many young fellow picked up a few extra bucks by washing harness, washing vehicles, or driving a horse. And uh, sometimes uh, some of these young fellows who uh, worked in livery stables not only learn how to handle a horse, but learn how to handle men, too. And some of them became quite successful in handling men in the business sense. So, uh, uh, you know, I guess the image of the livery stable depends very much upon the character of the individual who runs it. And that's one thing that I look back on my grandfather, that he, he was uh, kind and gentle, but he was strict and businesslike, and he didn't stand for any fool, particularly in, the, in his horses. And uh, over the, all those years that he operated the stable, I think I heard my father say that he only lost five horses uh, through them dying. Uh, in fact, I remember the last time that he had a horse out, and I think the the person that 
he had the rig, drove it himself. And I guess there's no, no blame attached to the driver of the horse, but after it was brought in and bedded down, uh, sometime during the night it died. And I, I can remember that my grandfather was very, he, he was really upset at the loss of the horse because uh, he was a, he, he, like a pet dog, you get attached, you know. And during all those years and all the horses that he had, I think they said he only lost five that way. This photograph shows uh, a, a single carriage with the, with the top, but the top's partly down. Uh, also, uh, a coach. Now that coach would have two seats in it, his car, it's got a hard top on it, but the driver sits up on the seats in the front, takes two horses to haul it, and is closed in with glass, like a limousine car with the doors. Uh, he also had uh, saddle horses because uh, some of the early guests that came to the hotel and cottages used to like to go uh, horseback riding. So he usually had uh, four or five saddle horses. In fact, there are some shelves back that are especially designed to hold saddles. This photograph uh, shows uh, a um, covered wagon, a single an open wagon, and uh, couple boys on horseback. Also gives you a picture of the the barn. This photograph uh, shows uh, a, a double ca covered carriage, single carriage, and uh, uh, this appears, I think, a, looks like a coach horse-drawn coach. Here we have a uh, single carriage with a cover. There's an open carriage. And uh, I can't tell. That looks like a perhaps a surrey with a fringe on top. Here we have a barouche. Uh, they're not very common. In Ottawa, the Governor General opened the House of Parliament. He used to use to ride one of these things. The only difference, they had a seat on the back for the foot guards. But it had a top which would come up over the back seat. Uh, doors open on each side to get in and out. But the front was open and a seat up on the front for the driver. It was called a barouche used for, I guess, VIPs to ride around in, drawn by two horses. Here we have a single open carriage, and in the background is the horse-drawn bus. Here again is the horse-drawn bus used to convey passengers to and from the station to the hotel has an Algonquin Hotel printed across the back of it. In the background, you can see the old former post office. Here again is a coach uh, used to haul passengers here and there, particularly used for weddings and funerals and people who want to uh, have a, a, a drive. Uh, well protected from the weather. I can remember getting a ride to school in this on many occasions, rainy days. Here is a, a coach where you can take the wheels off and put the runners on in the winter time. Here we have a, a double double sleigh, double pung, two seats in it, drawn by two horses. Usually they're side by side, but these were one ahead of the other. <laughs>
there's a single single sleigh and a horse. You notice the, uh, a driving horse has a harness suitable for a driving horse. A workhorse has a harness suitable for a workhorse, and they're different. This this uh, this harness has a uh, for a driving horse. Again, here's a single carriage, and the ha the harness is appropriate for a driving horse. Now I mentioned once before a motorized bus. This was purchased in the latter days of the stable, as Mallory's motor service on the side of it. The passengers uh, come in the door and the end, and there are windows along both sides. It's covered. Uh, door at the end. That's my father standing there at the end. We only had that two or three years before the uh, place closed. Here's the first taxi that we had. 1915 Ford, the brass front. Here's the first taxi too, brass front Ford. That was taken out at Wiley's Corner. Uh, my uncle was driving the car. That's yours truly right there, and my grandfather and grandmother. Uh, notice the size of the tires are altogether different. And this is the photograph that the carpenters used when they built, when they made new embellishments for the roof and the cupola. And here you see the uh, some of the vehicles. There's the brooch there. And the buckboard. You don't see many buckboards. There would be quite a variety in the vehicles in a, a livery stable that's used the year round. Uh, for instance, the, the so-called Surrey with the fringe on top. You just wouldn't use one of those in wet weather or in cold weather because it just simply had a flat top on it with a fringe around it, no siding on it, and you're open to the wind. But all the top did was keep the sun off mostly for summer use. Uh, they were two-seaters, uh, carry four or five passengers. Uh, if you had a driver, then he would have to count as a passenger. Then the double wagon uh, without any top uh, would be one that you would just simply use on a fine day. Uh, you might get caught in a rainstorm, but you took that chance. Uh, a double carriage with a top on it uh, usually came equipped with the uh, siding that you could put on with buttons, like the first cars that had the top which would go down, so that you were protected from the wind and from the, the uh, uh, weather, particularly in rain. And the same came with a single carriage with no top or express wagon to deliver parcels. Uh, the, sing the single carriage with the top on it, some of the tops would go down, but most of them stayed up all the time. You could put the siding on the side, but you couldn't put anything in front because you got to watch the horse. You got to have the reins out. Uh, the in the case of rainy weather, of course, uh, they always uh, used uh, rubberized uh, lap robes to keep the rain off their knees. And in the uh, uh, cold weather, then you had a heavier blanket robe. And in the, even in the summertime, many people wanted a light cotton lap robe to keep the dust. And if any, if the horses shed in the hair, keep the hairs off, uh, 
so that you had to have a variety of lap robes. And as far as sleighs are concerned in the wintertime, you had fur robes to put over the laps. And uh, sometimes you had foot warmers where you could put some hot bricks inside of them and they put them in the bottom of the sleigh, keep their feet warm. And then uh, as far as the coaches were concerned, they were used to go to the station and the, down to the wharves because uh, they were closed in. Uh, they had glass siding and uh, a door with a glass in it like the modern automobile. Uh, although the driver sat up on top out in, in the exposed to the weather. And uh, the buses, the horse-drawn bus where the passengers sit side along the sides, bumping their knees together, uh, they would have a siding which would roll down in case of rain and then roll up on fine days. The buckboard were used ma mainly to on excursions or picnics. You could, they had three seats in them plus a little single seat for the driver up front. They didn't have any top on them and mostly used for picnics and uh, parades, uh, that sort of thing, or a large outing. And uh, again, the coaches I used uh, for funerals and weddings. And uh, I might add too, that in the old days, the undertaker usually was a carpenter and the undertaking was a side, just a side trade. And the livery stable provided the hearse so we always had a big horse drawn, double horse drawn, two horses, a uh, hearse uh, to convey the, the dead in funeral processions. And I remember my father saying when it arrived at the station in a boxcar, he took two horses down to haul it up to the stable. And one old guy standing on the corner said, uh, Charlie, that was my father's name, People are dying to get a ride in that. But the irony of it, the poor old guy died someplace else and never got a ride in it. So those are the vehicles, uh, single sleighs and double sleighs, uh, express wagon, and then of course a truck wagon to ha handle the baggage and trunks. Because many of the guests that came to the Algonquin in the early days were not just here for a night and gone, like the modern tourists. They came and stayed a week, two weeks, some stayed all summer. And therefore they would have a a lot of luggage in the way of trunks. And uh, in those days you could stand at the back door of the hotel and look in and the empty trunks would lie in the corridors at the back of the hotel. So you see, uh, it not only transport passengers, but uh, luggage too. And uh, as I say, all the transportation needs of the guests at the hotel were looked after. So it required a, a, a variety of vehicles to suit the needs of these people. And uh, as I, I mentioned before, at that time, uh, many of the guests, uh, or perhaps I shouldn't say many, a number of the guests liked to go horseback riding. And there were a lot of trails around that they could follow. And uh, so a, a saddle horses were provided. And I can recall uh, a Professor Jeremiah Smith, who was a professor at Harvard University, came here for years. Uh, in fact, I think his cottage is owned now by Mrs. Cronenberger on the way down to the cove. Uh, he was a regular horseback rider, and somebody would take a horseback horse up to him to uh, go for a ride. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, many stables were at the rear of a hotel, and it was no problem to get a message to the stable that they wanted a vehicle. But in this case, it was so far away that 
and my grandfather had used to keep a boy with a bicycle up at the hotel. And he'd stay in the lobby at a little desk. And uh, anybody wanted a vehicle, he'd come down with a message of what vehicle wanted and uh, the needs and uh, the time. And uh, somebody would take it up and, uh, well, of course, if it was to have a driver, then the driver went along. If the customer is going to use it, drive it himself, then somebody would go up and get the person that delivered the v, the rig and bring them back. But then later, uh, he was able to get a private telephone line between the hotel lobby and uh, the office of the stable here. And uh, so that was the first telephone in the, in the place. So that did away with the boy on the bicycle. And, but uh, later on, they were putting a telephone line uh, from St. John to St. Stephen and a man by the name of Hoyt, who was one of the supervisors, used to, uh, in the course of supervising this job, stay in St. Anders and put his horse up here. So I got to know my grandfather very well. And my grandfather put the proposition up to him that why not start an exchange in St. Andrews? And so uh, he took it up with the telephone people and they said if he could get 35 customers to sign up, they would put an exchange in here. So my grandfather canvassed the town for customers. He didn't get quite the 35 but enough that Mr. White was satisfied. And they opened the first exchange in the building on the corner of Douglas and Water Street, across from uh, the Dory restaurant or bakery. So that's the story of the telephone and uh, the early days of conveying messages. And uh, uh, usually the guests at the hotel would have reservations. And uh, they would know who was coming when. And they had what they called a chief porter. And he always met the train. And he would arrive down here at the stable about half an hour before the train would arrive. And go over here in the office with who was to come. And uh, then they would go to the station, and between the chief porter and the operators of the vehicles at the station, they know who was coming and they put them on the vehicles and away they go to the station. He also collected their checks and looked after the, the transportation of their trunks and luggage. And he was the one also in the hotel who looked after storing the, the empty trunks in the rear of the hotel in the corridors. So that gives you a little idea uh, about the transportation in those days. And, and modern technology had changed the livery stable into the garage. And it did away with the horses. And we had motorized vehicles. And uh, also, horses had to be shod. And the blacksmith was the man that did that. And also, uh, if the the vehicle had a a steel rim, then the blacksmith was, he repaired that, and uh, or the wheelwright. Uh, if a rubber tire, that was a different thing. The blacksmith didn't do that, but the wheelwright could do that, and so. Uh, in the early days, as I recall, I can recall four blacksmith shops here in town. And they gradually disappeared so that there are none. And uh, a one wheelwright shop, it's at present the uh, Morton Mitchell's shop was a wheelwright shop. The operation of the barn, uh, I think my grandfather designed it, uh, having in mind that it would develop into quite an operation. First, there's the basement. 
the horses were kept in the basement. Uh, there were enough stalls there. Uh, he had as high at one time 15 horses, and they were kept down there. Uh, on the main floor, they had the carriages and the coaches. Uh, in the winter time, uh, the carriages, coaches, or not the coaches, but the carriages were put upstairs in the, the in the loft, and the sleighs were brought down. Sleighs were up in the summertime, you see, get them out of the way. But the uh, on the main floor, there was a space for the vehicles. In this corner, we call it the wash stand. And that's where they wash the carriages, because one thing about, there were no paved roads in those days, and the carriages got pretty muddy and dirty, and therefore, one of the secrets, I think, he insisted on the carriages being clean. Not only the wooden parts of them, but also the, the uh, upholstery. So there's a wash stand there which had a concrete floor in it. And uh, uh, that in that corner was the office. <laughs> that was the business center there. The next room was called the robe room, and it had rods on the walls extended out where they fold the lap robes. And uh, also in the corner were two bunks, as I mentioned, for the hired men. Uh, if the rig was out at night, somebody had to stay in to see that the carriage was properly placed when it came in, and the horse was bedded down and cleaned and fed and properly bedded. And uh, uh, there was a ramp on the outside for the horses to go into the basement. There was also a ramp on the inside where they could be taken down. Uh, it was narrowed down a few years ago into just a stairway. Uh, the other thing is that uh, a building surrounded by houses, uh, the manure had to be hauled away. You couldn't have a manure pile out under the window because of the odor. And uh, so every day the, the manure would be cleaned up and hauled out. Uh, there was a place to put it, but until it, you know, every day the truck wagon would back down and haul it out. Uh, he he would have a field or someplace out where it was away from buildings and uh, people could get it for their gardens if they wanted, but it was hauled away from the barn. The basement had a cement floor in it, as for mainly for cleaning its purposes. The stalls, of course, were of wood and wooden floors, but much of the odor that comes from a horse in a stable is from the urine. And therefore, the, the floors have to be properly disinfected and washed to keep down the odor. And uh, as I say, the manure hauled away. Uh, also, that horses uh, have to be groomed and properly washed. If not, they, they, they like a human being, if they don't bath, they smell. And horses will smell, and they have to be washed. They had to be groomed, and this all had to be looked after, and it was done in the basement. And the basement was washed down to keep the odor down. So the horses were in the basement, the vehicles on the main floor, alternating between summer and winter with the sleighs and wagons. But also, you know, horses can consume a lot of hay. So there was a big hay mow up there, too. And in that corner, you can probably see the place over there, was a hay chute where they would send the hay down from the loft into the basement. And over in that corner, there was an oat bin and a chute for the oats to go down into a small bin in the basement. And uh, a straw, too, for the bedding. Because horses have to be kept well strawed. The stalls must be strawed with fresh straw, and and the the men working have to keep cleaned out, and fresh straw on them so when they bed themselves down, they're clean. Again, 
keep them keep down the odor. Also in the basement there was what we called the harness room, where the harness was looked after, and the harness had to be cleaned too, uh, washed and uh, kept in, in order, and the brass on the on the harness had to be shined, so that you present a a good looking rig that doesn't have an odor, and the wagons are clean. So uh, I think that all together, uh, maybe that contributed to his success that he always turned out a pretty good rig. Uh, and I had that in mind because the original stable didn't have any basement in it. It was small. The horses were in the basement, the vehicles on this floor, and the uh, feed up above. And uh, he used to have men, uh, I remember, uh, some of the older people would remember Fonsie Dunahee, his brother Jack, and the father John, who died long years ago, and Andy. They used to do the haying for my grandfather. And they would bring the hay in and store it up in the loft. Uh, most of the oats and feed that he had, he would go up to his native Carlton County because he had brothers up there who were farmers. And they'd bring a carload or half a carload of hay down. But they'd bring it in jute bags and uh, store it up there in the bin. So I guess that uh, probably pretty well covers the, the operation of looking after the horses. Uh, the uh, main thing is that they were well groomed, washed, kept clean, keep down the orders, their manes trimmed and their tails, but not cut off or not bunched up in a bunch because that's the way they protect themselves from flies. And uh, the health of the horse uh, means a lot. That uh, Maybe that covers the uh, that that phase of the Leary Staver business, which maybe sometimes is lost sight of by the average person, doesn't notice what goes on. And the health of the horse is looked after. Uh, uh, Leary Staver runs 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And the one thing about a garage, when the vehicle stops, uh, it looks after itself pretty well, but the horse has to be fed and bathed and, and bedded and looked after whether he's out on the job or whether he just stand in the barn, which makes quite a difference. The health of the horse uh, means a lot. Of course, in those days, we didn't have any paved streets, so they used the iron shoe. And uh, you could hear them clicking along. But I sometimes wonder, with the coming of the paved uh, streets, that in some cases they use a a shoe that is uh, a softer, like it has some rubber in it that uh, is easier on the horse's hoof and the foot. So the blacksmith has been displaced by the, the garage, and the livery stable has been displaced by the taxi business, and the trains have been displaced by the airplanes. And so today we have uh, Jeffrey's business with the vans going to the airport. So there's the evolution of uh, the livery stable to the modern. Uh, and who knows if this place hadn't had closed and had gone on, we might have been running vans to the livery stable, who knows, or to the airport, who knows? But that's, uh, that's history and that's the way the thing goes. <laughs>